Are you tired of watching shows that only give you general social media theory and expect you to figure out how to apply it to your own industry? Join us for this week's episode of Social Chatter, the industry's longest running social media marketing news talk show. Not only will you learn the latest breaking news, but you'll also gain practical advice on how to apply it. Now here's your host, Christian Karasevich. Welcome, welcome everyone to Social Chatter, your weekly social media marketing news talk show. This is episode, let me double check, this is 237. Man, we're really uh, cranking. And uh, I'm excited about this week's show. We've got a lot of great topics to discuss with you in the land of social media. You know, we've got uh, topics from IGTV. For those of you not familiar with that, that's Instagram, their own TV show. So we've got IGTV. We're going to talk a little bit about some new updates to some live streaming tools, as well as YouTube live enhancements, some awesome tools, and this week's guest. And so I'm going to go and bring on Jim. Jim is co-hosting. He's uh, filling in for Phil Gerbershack. Phil's on a little bit of an extended break, uh, but uh, Phil, he uh, runs Fusion Marketing. Uh, so I'm going to go and bring on, uh, or sorry, Phil, Jim. Jim runs Fusion Marketing. Um, and this week's guest is uh, Angus Nelson. And uh, his website is angusnelson.com. So I'm going to go and bring on Jim. How you doing, Jim? Doing great. Uh, you know, I, I think the interesting thing about the current uh, situations that we're in, it's really because you and I talk about this a lot uh, off camera is just the whole idea of doing remote live stream production. And so I was pretty excited. Yesterday, I did my first uh, lot remote production with a company out of Virginia, mm -hmm. and we're doing a series of at least five uh they're calling them podcasts, but it's called the art of the possible. And so yesterday they interviewed a lady from Hilton and it was really went over well. They were thrilled and uh, we use StreamYard. So it's, this is a great program uh, platform to, to do that. And you don't have to get crazy technical, which I know sometimes you and I talk about people sometimes try to do a little too much, but uh, really excited about our guest today. Um, Angus Nelson, Angus and I have actually, uh, work together. He's a, uh, executive, uh, coach for, uh, high performing men. And I actually just finished working with him on a, on a three month program where he really helps you get your mindset, right. Your goals, right. And even, you know, getting you to get that, uh, your, your company or yourself going in the right direction. So he's in Nashville and, uh, saw him speak or originally where he really caught my attention was at social media world Lima last year when he was one of the speakers and he's a powerful speaker and just a, just a great guy and has an incredible story. Uh, you know, he, he, he shows you that you can go through things in life and, and still bounce back and, and, and do great things. Fantastic. So let's go ahead and bring on Angus and, you know, I've, I've heard a lot about Angus. Um, so I'm actually going to see about uh, chatting with him myself. I mean, because mindset is extremely important, especially in business. And I will say right now, you know, we're not going to harp on COVID-19 and all this other stuff that's going on, but mindset is very important. And I'm sure Angus, you probably have a lot of people right now who they might be getting down on themselves because, you know, what all is going on, it really impacts them and causes them to have to change their business. But it's fantastic to have you join us on Social Chatter this yeah. week. Thanks. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the kind words, Jim. And yeah, mindset's a huge component, man. We could take the whole show and just talk about that. That's my jam, you know. But one of the things I'm, I've been talking to some of my uh, my clients and my audience about is this whole fact that there's an element of um, you know some of the stuff that we are are giving too much attention to, and I, I call it the nope theory. You know, mm -hmm. in the nope theory, there's a uh, element of three or excuse me, four things, you know, there is noise, there are opinions, and then there are um, these pressures and experiences. So all the noises around, it's all the chatter, everybody uh, from media to the news on the newspaper, to the magazines, to the websites or whatever, there's news everywhere. That's all noise. Everything that's on your social chat is noise. 
And then mm -hmm. it's opinions. Have you ever noticed how many of our friends have now become healthcare experts <laughs> and they're quoting this and they're putting up stats and they're, they're showing their spreadsheets and you're like, when the hell did you know so much about this stuff? Like they're projecting how this thing's going to like spread. And then you've got the pressure. Like some people are losing their jobs. Some people are in fear of losing their jobs. Some people are like, what do I do now? You're feeling the pressure and the anxiety and the underlying psychology that's just kind of uh, uh, appealing to your day. So that's why we're shopping for comfort food. We're not going and buying kale. We're going to go find crap macaroni and cheese. Like we are looking for comfort, right? And then the last piece of it is experience. Like in the past, it looked like this. In the past, it was, you know, supposed to go like this. Mm -hmm. New norms, man. Like mm -hmm. you cannot let your old experience translate into a new world. And so that's nope. Just say nope to the noise, to the opinions, <laughs> um, to, to the uh, pressure and the experiences. And that's it, how you can focus for being successful right now. Definitely. You know, and I know there's, as you mentioned, I mean, we could take the whole show and talk about this. Um, yeah. But we're gonna have we're gonna have a couple of questions for uh, for you later on in the show to talk about uh, with viewers. So hopefully you'll uh, you know I know you're gonna have some great insight for them. Yeah. So um, so Jim, you ready to kick things off? Yes. I'm not gonna say nope. I'm gonna say yes. Come on. <laughs> By the way, I yeah. want to thank you for watching. Uh, so far, we've got uh, Joanne Crawl. Thanks a lot for joining us. I know it's early, maybe for you. Uh, so uh, where do you want to start, Jim? I, I think let's uh, let's start with what Instagram TV is doing with ads. I think that's uh, definitely something people need to think about. We've talked about this a little bit more, but the fact that you can start looking at monetizing, I mean, it kind of goes in the way of Facebook and also, uh, you know, YouTube as, as well, if you get your subscriber channel up. So this really as a creator, as a business gives you a reason to say, hey, I need to start doing something with my Instagram TV. I might be able to make a little bit of money off of this if I have something of value. Definitely. And, and I think the first thing we should probably talk about here is that, you know, you're, you talked about that briefly, you know, uh, as far as money, like, yes, you should be trying to monetize your business in a lot of these different aspects, but keep in mind that, you know, you're going to see all these other stories out there. And this kind of plays off to what Angus was telling earlier, but People are going to sell these stories about, oh, well, there's this person making, you know, millions of dollars a year on a YouTube channel or an Instagram channel or whatnot. Um, that is not the norm. So, you know, you can't let that noise get to you. Um, maybe it should instill some confidence in you, but you can't let it get to you. But uh, the bottom line here is Instagram, you know, they're rolling out IGTV uh, ad guidelines. Um, not a whole lot here. I mean, if you really think about it, I mean, did you have a chance to look through the guidelines that they've they've rolled out, Jim? No, I need to because I know I looked at the Facebook ones before and I just I'm not even going to try to go, you know, worry about monetizing my Facebook lives because it's crazy the amount of views and everything you have to get in order to to make make it successful. I, I would almost say you, you would have to run ads to right. get to that point to get an audience as large as they want for you to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. Angus, have you? Have you looked at this stuff at all as far as monetizing videos on Facebook uh, on, or Instagram? Not on Instagram. I mean, when I saw that news when you guys posted that, like, I think it's fascinating because, you know, it's there are different audiences and we're starting to see all of these different social channels kind of, um, you know, in some ways become the same, but yes. different. Right. Yeah. Same in the context of the structure, the monetization and, you know, some of the algorithms are starting to kind of meld. But the other component is the audiences. So the mm -hmm. audiences are changing where, you know, now it's like an older demographic has kind of come in and, and, and settled in on Facebook. But the younger demographic, um, kind of a median demographic is, you know, now in Instagram. So that's, you know, a whole different component. And then, of course, then we get into TikTok and it's only a matter of time, only a matter of time before that's going to be part of that uh, activity as well. Yeah. Um, and so these are the different components that are, are super uh, interesting, but the getting paid for the time people spend on platform mm -hmm. is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's, you know, YouTube altogether. That was then Facebook. And now to see it, you know, obviously trickle into IG makes absolute sense. It's a Facebook property. Yeah. Um, and then I imagine, you know, the next step will be TikTok. It's like there's going to be some ad revenues according to content creation there as well. 
Well, and and we probably don't think about it because I don't know, maybe maybe you guys are big gamers, but then you also have Twitch mm. and Mixer where you've got mm-hmm. you've got gamers literally, you got some of these people making millions of dollars off of playing video games. And you know, maybe if it had been around, you know, 30, 40 years ago when I was you know playing the Atari twenty six hundred, I would have been on. all over it. <laughs> Be all about it. Give me some asteroids. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> My favorite yeah. video game back in the day. This was not something that you could find on, you know, a, a console. It's actually you had to go in. I used to go play it at Godfather's Pizza. Do you remember Godfather's Pizza? Yes. And uh, it was a game called Kangaroo. And that was like my jam where you'd like kind of like Donkey Kong. You'd like climb up ladders and go to different levels. And, you know, these yeah. monkeys would be throwing apples at you and stuff. So similar to that. But you had a, a kangaroo with boxing gloves. Boom, 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 boom. That was my jam. And I was at my friend's bar mitzvah and I was getting my highest score possible. And all the kids were like crowding around me and we're like cheering as I'm playing and I'm getting better and, you know, give a higher score, higher score. And the kid whose bar mitzvah it was uh, pulled the plug on the game because he didn't like the fact that I was getting all the attention. No, touche to his point. It was his bar mitzvah. I shouldn't have been stealing it. But man, I was on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll say this. I mean, the bottom line here with this whole, you know, IGTV ad guidelines. I mean, if you look at the guidelines here, they're pretty straightforward. You know, stay up to date on Instagram's community guidelines. Basically follow their Mm -hmm. terms of service. Only share content you created and which you have the rights to use. Very simple. Maintain an established presence for your account. Very simple. You open an account, keep it going. Or, you know, if you don't want to earn any money on it, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't use it. You know, and then going into like some of the don'ts, don't post content you didn't create or don't have the right to use. Don't post content that could be considered false, misleading, or overly sensational. Don't share content in ways that compromise quality for viral distribution. The bottom line is they just want you to follow the rules, you know, for IDTV. And it's not going to just lead to uh, generating lots of revenue. I mean, you have to have good content, you know, that your audience is interested in. Uh, you know, and uh, that can be something as simple as like, like, okay, so I'm going to share a tip. Uh, if somebody wants to find what kind of content they should be creating for IGTV, ask your audience, send them maybe a form or send them an email or go live on Instagram and ask them to send you a DM with, you know, uh, what kind of content maybe they want to create. What about you? Jim? What, what do you think people should do to figure out what kind of content they should be posting on IGTV? Well, I mean, one maybe go look at uh it's you know they some si- say that uh you know uh, imitation is a sincerest form of flattery go see the people that are maybe in the same area that you are that are successful and see what you can take from that but don't try to be them still be yourself mm-hmm. um you know one of the things like that that I'll say you know that Angus helped me with is like he's like you know there's a ton of marketers how do you set yourself apart and right. what your message is as a marketer. So I now do marketing the Marine Corps way. You know, there's not a lot of people that do that. I might be the only one, right, Angus? Yeah. Um, so, but I think one of the things with the don'ts, it's not clear here that we see a lot of people make this mistake is everybody always wants to bring in music mm-hmm. and they don't have the rights to it. And then they get right. their stuff taken down and they go, well, I don't understand. Well, you, you got to know the rules and uh, it it's not it's not out there, but you know, cause you know, it gets confusing, right? Cause you can do stories using Spotify music, right. uh, but it doesn't mean that you get to use it for IGTV. Yeah. Correct. So Angus, what do you think? Is it what, if somebody wants to figure out, so if they want to make the right content to, you know, get some traction with IGTV, what should they do? What's so, your- yeah. So, so uh, the, the common rule of thumb is that you go find an audience and then you create content for that audience. I have a different rule of thumb. I don't even call it a rule of thumb. I don't know where rule of thumb came from, but I have a a different philosophy. And that is this, we attract what we are. And likely the content you're already creating is already attracting a certain persona. Okay. And just do more of that. Now, if the persona you're attracting is not the one you want, then you can start modifying your content and you can start stepping up. Like for me, when I started having clients, I was at a certain level of people I attracted, but now I want to attract a higher level of, of, of clients who have either a different way of thinking, a different affluence, a different uh, mindset, you know, and trajectory. So I had to improve and raise my 
you know, content. Well, right. that's another part of the philosophy. And I wish that more people recognize that the value that you are is what you're bringing to the table. I, I love what Jim said is, you know, continue to be you. It's mm -hmm. just you start modifying it a little bit by a little bit incrementally to attract higher level engagement, higher level um, audience. Fantastic. So, Jim, where, uh, anything else you want to add uh, about IGTV ad guidelines? No, I think I think I think it's definitely, you know, take a look at it. It'll probably tell you if you're eligible for it. I, I mean, I think there's probably still a lot of people that haven't even yeah. done an IGTV video. Yeah, right. Um, which I think is still, it's 10 minutes. Uh, I think you can get more if you're someone that's producing a lot of content on there, but kind of goes back to what Angus said, right? Everybody, mm -hmm. every platform is, is basically become the same in some aspect. Mm -hmm. So don't sit there and say, oh, well, I, now I got to go get on Instagram TV. Well, if you haven't been spending time on Instagram to begin with, why are you going to go there? Um, it, you know, I had this conversation the other day with a lady, she's like, well, I put stuff on the same post on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. And it's like, well, what's your ideal client? You know, well, B2B. I said, then why are you on Facebook and Instagram? Mm. Focus on LinkedIn. Yeah. And uh, it's like, well, yeah. no, it's not. It's exactly. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, since we're talking about Instagram, they're actually doing some stuff on desktop and mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense because we're all sitting in front of our computers right now because we're not allowed outside. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, but they're letting you now watch, uh, the Instagram live on desktop, which I think is a great move. I, I think a lot of, a lot of people want more ability of Instagram on desktop because it's just easier. Maybe it's cause like, I don't know, it's the thumb thing, Angus, but you know, we, we all can't manage these little cell phones and smartphones to, to do everything. And we want to have this bigger space of the desktop to do things. It's fat finger syndrome. Yes. <laughs> I, so, I got to yeah. say, the timing, you know, obviously the timing makes the most sense here because if people are at home, so like chance are people are viewing on mobile when they're out and about, you know, I, don't, I mean, maybe people are like walking down their hallway or their house and they're like, you know, checking their Instagram feed, but I don't think they're doing it as much um, being at home. So I think having the ability to view Instagram live videos on the web, I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, uh, I don't think this is going to all of a sudden lead to, you know, every single Instagram feature becoming available on the web, but, uh, you know, it definitely makes sense for Instagram to roll this out. What do you think, Angus? Good move? Yeah, of course. It's all timely. Um, and, you know, furthermore, going back to what we were saying before um, about an older demographic being attracted to uh, Facebook, well, desktop is where this other demographic is most comfortable. What is the next step for Instagram to expand its, you know, its tenure, its, its longevity is to now bring in new audience because their audience from Instagram is eventually going to go to someplace else, whether that's switch and right. whether that's TikTok or whatever. So for, in order for them to stay in the game, is they have to think about what's their next audience. Going to desktop is going to make it even more accessible now mm -hmm. to a new audience because the kids are going to complain, but the parents are coming. It's just like we slowly <laughs> will navigate over there next. You know, that's yeah. when people get tired of Facebook and they're like, I need something different. They're going to go over to Instagram. So like a lot of this is kind of the building the longevity of a platform. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes sense in that number one. And then number two to Jim's point is, what a great time, you know, for them to, they've probably been working on this for a while. All of a sudden they just hit the pedal to the metal and accelerated their deployment into the marketplace. And here we are. Definitely. And uh, the other thing also I want to make sure I mention here is just something that's highlighted in the article. So if you, you know, if you check out this article, it's from Engadget. There's not a whole lot here, but the one key thing is you cannot start a broadcast from your desktop. That is a key point that I want to make for everyone. So, you know, if you're like, well, hey, I want to brought like, even let's just take StreamYard, for example. That's the yeah. platform that that uh, we use for social chatter. You know, you cannot broadcast to Instagram. You know, yeah. if there are tools that say you can do it, they cannot because yeah. Instagram does not yeah. make it part of their API access. So that means that these software companies do not get access to do it. The ones that do have this functionality, um, they are basically violating Instagram's terms of use and you can actually get your account banned if you use that tool. 
Now, as far as the fact that like you can only view from desktop right now, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. People can go on their browser. For example, there's no native I, uh, Instagram app on an iPad, so they could go through the browser and view the content. Again, it's about viewing. So um, if you're looking for a shortcut here, there's not a shortcut. You still have to create it on mobile, but you can view it from desktop. Let me make sure that's clear to everybody. And it's likely that that will be deployed later. Um, yeah. If this is a rush to market play, which I suspect it is, mm -hmm. you know, then this gives them some protection that they only have to deploy what's actually functional, what's actually working right now. You know, and one other caveat to this is something that's interesting, kind of related, is just know that the content you're putting out there, um, there was a Supreme Court lawsuit that was just settled um, that stated that um, the ownership of that is now you've relinquished your ownership of your images and uh, your video for putting up an Instagram. So yeah, if yeah. you're teaching proprietary intellectual property or something of that nature, just know that when you're putting that out there, if you're a photographer and you're putting that out there, mm -hmm. that you have relinquished your rights to it. And so yeah. if some other company wants to use that as user generated content, there's now some real discrepancy as to the ownership rights of that because mm -hmm. of this new lawsuit that's been uh, a judgment that's been placed. Yeah, wow. that's, I, that's that's uh, that's huge, because I think before, like that was kind of people's fears, like, oh, well, I I got to ask permit. I mean, and we and I think we'd all agree you still should ask people if you're going to share their mm -hmm. content or give them credit. But the fact that you've got this ruling that kind of goes where it's more like the public domain type of information that that's uh that's huge yeah it just came out yeah. yesterday i would put it in the comments here i don't have a comment let me jump into facebook here where i can put in the comments i think you, you might be able to i think maybe go in and leave it but um so the other part to that i mean you know the fact that i actually think that that makes a lot of sense that if it's in public domain you know that um, it could become user-generated content if you think about it because you know, Jeb, you and I get this question all the time when we're working with people on a live video, and it's the fact that, you know, oh, they want to use a countdown timer. They want to, you know, um, they want to use some music that they found. You know, they found it on Google, for example. And it's like, well, it's on Google. Why can't I use it? And it's like, well, you still need to ask people for permission, regardless of, mm -hmm. you know, hey, it's out there. Just make sure you can actually use it. Um, we go th through this a lot as well for people that want to do uh, maybe a fitness, you know, you and I've talked about this, Jim, a lot about people wanting to do a fitness video or they want to do some sort of workout video at home. And they're like, hey, I have a license to use, you know, music in my uh, business, my physical business. And I want to now do something online because I don't have my physical business. And the thing is, you've got to read that terms of use. I mean, they are very strict in the fact that you can probably only use it at the physical location, you need a separate license for live streaming. Um, so definitely keep that in mind. By the way, uh, Mona uh, Jordana says, hey, you know what? She says she's loving using Facebook Creator to post to IGTV and Instagram and Facebook. So if you do have content you want to get out there, definitely check out the Facebook Creator platform as well. So thanks a lot, uh, Mona, for um, for letting us know about that. Uh, so, uh, Jem, where are we going next? Well, let's talk about a new StreamYard feature. They're uh, they're doing five minute overlay videos. Okay. I think Angus's new camera cut out on him for a second. Oh no! <laughs> we Chris, can hear you. <laughs> oh no! Hold on. Let me change cameras. Maybe it conked out on me. So so yeah. So they've gone to where the so overlays the were yeah. were thirty seconds. And now we're going up to five minutes. Um, so it's an interesting feature. And that's actually how you start this show. You have the overlay is what that is. It's not an actual, you know, it, I mean, overlay slash video. Um, but going to five minutes, I, I think it's a nice feature. But as you and I were talking before the show, why do I need a five minute overlay? And what, what's your thoughts? So I, um, me or Angus? You, because okay, so I I an overlay serves a couple of purposes. So, for example, uh, our my overlay that I use it's let's under that thirty seconds because that's what was available at the time when I created it. But um, I think overlays are useful at the beginning and the ending of a video. So, if you want to make an intro or an outro, they're fantastic for that. Now, are, am I going to watch a five minute 
overlay or a five minute intro video or outro video? No, the, I would say maybe a minute max, you know, for something like that. Um, the only way I could see a five minute uh, video being useful would be this. I think if I'm going to um, do a five minute countdown timer, you know, maybe three to four minutes of that would be, you know, I launch the show three to four minutes early so I can kind of make sure everything's ready to go. And then I can have, you know, one to two minutes of that or even just a minute of it for an intro video. I wouldn't, though, say, hey, let's make a five minute intro video just because I can. What do you think, Jim? Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you. And I think this goes back to what we've talked about before is, uh, you know, and even the, the the three pillars of StreamYard, right? Easy use, professional looking streams and, and just that that whole aspect of it is why do I need a five minute overlay? Right. I, I mean, it's just like people that are always saying, oh, I want to, you know, I want to do a, you know, um, what is it? All these crazy things they've been talking about wanting to do on these on these videos. It's like just do oh, green screens. Right. It takes right. so much lighting to do a green screen. Right. Do mm -hmm. you really need a green screen? Right. And, you know, it's like you're adding all this technical aspect. It's the basics. Right. It's your content that people are there for. They're not there to to see all the gadgetry, and right. um, you know. And I think that's I think that's part of the challenge is that people get too complicated, right? Just it, you, it's the kiss method. Keep it simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, Angus, what do you think about five minute overlays? Do you see? I don't know. I was so panicked here getting my video back <laughs> on. I'm totally lost. <laughs> well, uh, the bottom line: Streamyard launched five. So they previously let you do a thirty second maximum video length that mm -hmm. you could apply to an intro video an outro video a mid-roll uh, but they've now relaxed that and increased it to five minutes mm. so you know should people make five minute intro videos how do you think they should do it i said hey maybe do yeah. a couple minutes of countdown and then do like an intro video uh what do you think so i i'm really big on engagement period Okay. So the real question here is here, is it creating engagement? If people are engaging, then what's it matter? If this is catching their attention, it's bringing them information or entertainment. Um, and, and that's some of the key components. Education and entertainment are two key, key components. If you're giving that hook, then that video should be bringing them into your content in some form that is complementary to your message. And so... If it's a recap, let's say, I mean, this is this is just my creativity kicking in. You know, whenever you watch a new show, yeah, yeah. it's going to like bring you up like uh, in the last episode, you know, um, right. and it's yeah. going to like give you that high intensity, you know, fast cut, you know, bam, 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 bam. Um, and then it keeps you up to speed. So if you've got some kind of episodic show that you're creating, like suddenly mm -hmm. that makes a ton of sense. And what example I like to give people, by the way, is this. I like to tell them, you know what, when you watch, and I realize you can fast forward if you're watching Netflix or like anything like that, but mm -hmm. uh, I always tell them, watch a movie or a TV show, the introduction that's there. You know, mm -hmm. that's your hook, you know? Yeah. And for the most part, like, yes, every intro to a TV show is like, you know, some sort of fade in. They start to introduce, you know, go down the list of characters, the director, you know, and the main actor and the supporting actor, you know, all the people that are featured in that show, maybe there's a couple of B-roll scenes, but roll through that and then they get right into the show. And for example, if you find yourself fast forwarding past the intro of like a vid, uh, say a TV show, hmm. Hmm, maybe they need to like scale that down and make it a little more engaging because it's not, it's not doing enough to keep people for watching that two to three minutes instead of getting right mm -hmm. to the content. So um, I, I like Jim's method as well. Like keep it simple, but less is more, I think on this one. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, anything yeah. else you want to add there, by the way? No, I mean, I just, I think it's a great tool. And I see that uh, Mona had a, a comment about, uh, she said she thinks the StreamYard is the PC equivalent of Ecamm on the Mac. Um, I, I think it's actually something that you can use on both. It, it's actually, because we're actually both, Mac users. So, uh, it's just really a matter of how, how technical that do you want to get? I mean, I have Ecamm, uh, the issue though with Ecamm is bringing in guests right. and that's where StreamYard is, is easier. Cause otherwise, you know, we'd be having to use Skype to, mm -hmm. to come on. And I think you would be limited to, is it three, uh, uh total on Ecamm? 
you are, I don't know the like, number offhand, but you do have to bring them in via Skype and Skype else. I mean, Skype is a very resource intensive program. So you have to bring in somebody via a virtual camera. It's pretty seamless, but it's not as easy as using StreamYard. But I will say this, I mean, you know, uh, Angus, you and I were talking about this before the show. So like StreamYard is great for producing an interview style show, mm -hmm. you know, or if I want to just do like a quick tutorial, but I don't necessarily need to maybe zoom in on certain parts of my screen and whatnot. It's good for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but for Ecamm, you know, I know you and I were talking about this, Angus, because uh, we're working with the Ecamm um, Live Video Summit as well that they're doing. You know, it's the fact that uh, leap in the live streaming. Yes. <laughs> uh, their product is, you know, it's very good for like being able to do a, like to basically have different scenes that you're working through, you know, to create your full video that you're making versus you know, stream art. It's, it's mainly for like ideal for interviews and things like that, I think. Um, so that's my, my thoughts. Any, uh, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I um <clears throat> I agree with what you're saying. Like StreamYard is just drop dead easy. That's that's what I love about StreamYard is it it makes it super easy. And uh, that was my first intro into this realm. And and quite frankly, you know, one of the advantages also is they have connection with um, LinkedIn Live, yeah, which mm -hmm. I have access to as well. So <clears throat> in Ecamm, you have to go through a third party to get to. Um, your LinkedIn Live. So that's one little caveat. And then the interview base, um, yeah, that's a, a little bit of, you know, um, a sidekick that you got to have, you know, the Skype. <clears throat> Where I think the advantage goes to Ecamm is if you think in context of presentation, mm -hmm. if people are going virtual right now and you want to give some kind of a talk or presentation, I think Ecamm has some really cool capacities in the fact like we were talking before like i have three cameras set up and so i've got you know a camera here on the side of me a camera you know up below me and then you know one direct on and now all of a sudden i have production value that keeps things super interesting and these overlays and everything else right. that now you can bring a live presentation onto a virtual world versus you know just being one track one screen you know, like that can get kind of boring um, so I think that's an advantage to Ecamm is to create a little bit more interest um, in what's possible. And it depends on what you're doing as well. I mean, so if you're do if you're producing a show, mm -hmm. you know, where like you in a way almost script stuff out, like you know, Ecamm and StreamYard both have like similarities there, but mm -hmm. it really comes down to how much more you want to push that envelope. And I mean, I like to say this. I mean, as Jim mentioned, use the right tool for the job. Mm -hmm. So. You know, a lot of people are talking about Zoom right now, and Zoom is great for online meetings. Yeah. If you're going to do like a teaching, you're going to be teaching a whole lot of people at one time, and you want them all on the same screen. But Zoom, for instance, is not a live video platform. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people will say, hey, I'm just going to, they try to use the one tool. And it's yeah. like, well, it sort of works, but it doesn't work like it should. And it's you got know? that long delay, that big drag, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. when, when you're into Zoom. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing I was going to say, and this was what you were just uh, kind of alluding to, I think, yep. um, in in StreamYard, you can already preset some of your lower third little tidbits in there. Yep. And so you can ask the questions or create the statements or quotes that you want to have and basically guide yourself with some notes mm -hmm. through the yes. presentation because yep. that becomes your triggers to the next component. Because here's one of the things too about live streaming is I have something to say. Yeah. You know, one of my like little things that kind of gets annoyed, annoying to me is when people are like, oh, just wanted to jump in and blah, 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 and just <laughs> banter. Like, <Right. laughs> I suppose there's a place for that. But if you're about thought leadership, if you're about serving and adding value to people's mm -hmm. lives, like, have some kind of context. Like this morning, I did my first live. I was telling you guys using this Ecamm thing. Yep. And it actually turned on by accident. And I'm over here like fumbling. The Right here is the 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 laptop. And you know, it was just looked all drinky. And then I realized it was recording. I'm like, hey, and we're live. And <laughs> I told everybody out the gate, like, this is the first time I've ever used this. Hey, check this out. And I jumped to camera one, camera two, camera three. 
<laughs> like you just, you know, that was just like, oops. But I had something to say. I said, but don't go anywhere because what I want to talk to you is about the main thing and to keep the main thing, the main thing. And of course, I had another acronym for that one too. So <laughs> adding value. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, one thing I want to do quickly, I mean, you mentioned this about being able to have like bullet points in a way or lower thirds and whatnot. You know, I'm going to share like the eCamp or sorry, the StreamYard screen right now, actually. Yeah. And you'll see along the sidebar here, you'll see these are the lower thirds that we have for the show, for example. Yep. You know, things that in a way like, you know, you can drag and drop to reorder them, but you can quickly, this can be like, okay, this is the first point I'm going to make. This is the second, third, fourth, and so forth. So you can go directly into your, you know, important points that you want to get across yeah. on your broadcast. Um, so definitely something you want to keep in mind there, but that's, that's easy to do in StreamYard, like very, and you easy. can save those, like yeah. you can organize yes. them and you can, you can have, uh, like, if you have some systematic, you know, kind of approach to some of your talks that you do like a weekly show, like you can have some folders that are saved with just right. the things you need, the, the elements mm -hmm. you need for that particular show. It's pretty right. cool. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So that's what we got from StreamYard this week. Uh, five minute overlays. Again, be very careful with how you use them. Um, if you're not sure, you know, if, if five minutes is like long enough or is it should it be three minutes or two minutes or one minute or whatever else. Um, this next topic, actually, I think we should talk about, Jim. I think this is a topic that uh, people should definitely pay attention to. And it's the fact that uh, YouTube is rolling out uh, live stream analytics for creators. And, you know, and, and I think this is a really important point. And it's the fact that you can now go into your videos and you can see the ones that are native videos versus the ones that are live versus the ones that are face, uh, YouTube premiere videos. You can go in and see the breakdown of each stream to see which ones are generating the most uh, views and the most time on your channel. Uh, what do you guys think about this? Is this, you know, a good feature to have? Um, how, do, how do you think a business should approach this? No, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I think when it really comes down to it, you, you've got to have ways to measure effectiveness and right. it doesn't matter what platform it's on. That's why in some times people say, well, I want to live stream on my profile because I don't want to have a page. It's like, why? You can't tell how you might see views, but you have no idea how long people watched it for. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't, uh, use ads on your personal profile. Right. I, I almost, I, you know, I know some people might not like it, but I'll say I almost call that lazy, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. go through the rigor of, of, if you're a business, be a business. And, and not to mention, you could theoretically be violating the terms of service on Facebook of using your personal profile as a business page. And that's not supposed to yep. be what you do. You can share business stuff on your personal page, right. But right, you go to Facebook jail, you, you're going to lose. So I think this is great because that that's actually a question you, people get like, well, how do I how do I know how many people watched my show live? Right. Well, uh, and so if you get an idea, you know, because a lot of times it's like it's not so much about the live viewers. It's about the replay viewers. Yes. Because you're just never going to find that perfect time that everybody can come watch your show, even though. Maybe right now, theoretically, they have more time. They should all be watching this show today, especially because Angus is here. And by the way, to, to that point, by the way, if somebody were um, like, so right now, another another useful feature to this is the fact that you can go and you can see, you know, the breakdown of live versus on-demand viewing for YouTube creators. And you can also see whether somebody's watching a live stream versus they're actually watching the replay. You know, and, um, it, you know, it really is a no brainer. I mean, like, yes, live video is a fantastic tool. However, you do have to be mindful of how much time you spend doing it, because if you're just spending time doing it and you're not getting anything out of it, um, maybe you want to consider doing native uploads. I mean, you can get a mm -hmm. lot of value out of a YouTube native uploaded, a natively uploaded video, uh, much more than you can doing a live video if you don't have the audience or the community. So well, anyway, yeah. When you yeah. when you consider mm -hmm. how many how many of these YouTube creators that are that are huge, were doing this before YouTube had live, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't even necessarily say that some of them are using live as their way to continue to grow their channels, because right. they are actually putting together 
a production value video where they're mm-hmm. doing cuts and takes and editing it because they don't mm-hmm. want to, you know, the, the value of live, right? Like you have the little things that go wrong at times, you know, mm-hmm. Angus's camera dropped off. Well, if this was a recorded video, you could have edited that mm-hmm. so nobody would have ever known. But, you know, the show must go on when it's live. So no, I think this yeah. is this is great. Uh, great that they're providing this information to their to their users. So I guess, what yeah. do you think? Yeah, go yeah. Ahead. I was just going to say, like, you know, in the same component, you got to have an audience first um, before live even makes sense. But mm-hmm. you can't you can't improve what you don't measure. Right. And so if you have an audience and now all of a sudden you've got backdoor analytics to find out what's actually you know going on, now you can improve. Oh my gosh, we're losing a lot of people at a minute and a half. That means we're not giving them big enough hook. How can we do that in a live setting to, you know, create the hook that we want to create? Um, that kind of analytics gives you the visibility into what needs to be modified, improved, um, so that you can keep people around longer. Because in YouTube and all other channels, especially but YouTube, people are making money from views. So the more attention you can keep them on platform. Mm-hmm. You also in a revenue stream. And so that's a, an important thing to note too. So if you've got thousands and thousands, if not millions of followers, you can get them onto a live and now you've got them on a hook because you've got a relationship and rapport. It's less dependent on the content, more dependent on the relationship. And you've already created this rapport. Now you can get away with ridiculous stuff. And now you're doing like a two, three, four hour live and people are camping out because they just want to be a part of whatever you're doing versus most small, medium businesses. They get on and they're like, let me show you about my tchotchke. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and now you're going to lose people because you're not doing it or positioning in a way of interest in storytelling and, you know, compelling content. And that's when looking at these analytics will show and reveal to you, hey, that was probably a little too salesy or that was not focused on the consumer, the customer, the actual ideal client. Definitely. And I think that's a really important points that you made. So uh, anything else you want to add on the topic of uh, this whole, like, you know, these new YouTube uh, analytics? Now, if you're if you're a YouTuber, you definitely want to check it out. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, it's definitely worth worth uh, doing. And it, and it's I think all the all the platforms are trying to give us more data. The question is, will at some point they try to charge you to get extremely detailed data? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with that, so I know we've got more news topics, obviously that we love to discuss, but we want to make sure you know we value your time, so we want to make sure we. We also let you spend some time with Angus because again, I mean, we brought him on not just to like banter about social media news. Um, so Jim, do you want to run through some questions that we had for Angus? Yeah. Um, so Angus, one of the, we, we got three questions we wanted to ask you today. And the first one is, um, why is it important to identify your ideal customer? And I think that's something that in your business that you actually, that's something that you've got really good at. Yeah. In fact, um, so my my day job company is a golden spiral marketing, which is all focused on B2B technology marketing. So you're looking at fintech, cybersecurity, health tech, you know, a SaaS focused product. Those companies, like they're looking at a very defined audience. You know, it's a limited um, accessibility to the kind of, you know, market that they're going. So when you have a limited market, you've got to get super streamlined on your messaging. And by doing that messaging, you've got to appeal to the emotion, the challenges, the fears, and the needs of your ideal client. And that's where most people miss it, even on B2C, is they don't look at what is the actual thing that people want. We're really good at talking about you know, our technology. We're good at talking about our, our tchotchkes. We're good at talking about our origin story. We're good about all these other things. But we're sometimes and often forgetting about the customer. What's the problem that your product or service solves? And how are you articulating that in an emotional way that people feel compelled to learn more? And uh, so, yeah, yeah, I think it's super critical that you identify your ideal customer. Awesome. And so we'll go to the, the next question would be, Angus, um, 
Can a business have more than one target customer? Um, they absolutely do. And here's what I mean by that. Um, particularly in my space, you know, B2B technology marketing, you've got different buyers at different levels with different needs. So in one company, you could have a C CEO has one context, a CMO has a different context, a CRO has a different context. So they're looking at different mandates that are placed on them in terms of performance, in terms of revenue, in terms of, you know, um, growth. Those are all things that are articulated in different ways. And though they may be looking at the same mountain, they're all looking at it from a different perspective. And therefore, the messaging needs to be modified according to their needs. So if the more that you know who that specific buyer is, the more pertinent it becomes. So in a B2C space, it can look different as well. If you have a product that can appeal to a woman who's in her late 20s, who maybe has one or two children, that's going to have a different need set. And then that same product, you could cater to a teenage um, male who's all around sports, then you could message it a different way. It all depends on who you're marketing to, your product and service, how it appeals to that person and then position it in such a way. And so having multiple uh, personas is possible, absolutely. The caveat to this, I would say, is if you try to please everyone, you obviously will please no one. That is the common phrase, and it's true. And so the more that you can identify who you're going after in specific campaigns, the better off you are. That could be seasonal, that could be, you know, according to like right now where we have a certain situation. And so you're appealing to real time, you know, relevance, <clears throat> or it could be lifestyle, you know, where are they at in their life cycle? Or maybe they're at a different age, um, a graduation, or, you know, they're um, coming out of um, some program. Like these are the different things where now you can have touch points that make your product or service a little bit more relevant. Um, change of season. I just had the HVAC guy here coming and fixing some stuff on my HVAC unit. Like getting into uh, your audience in early spring before everything gets busy and chaotic, like that's the ideal time for them to appeal to parents, uh, to appeal to, um, you know, the, the changing season. Like the messaging is now wrapped into the ideal need, the ideal person at the ideal time. And, and finally, Angus, what steps can a business take to identify their target customer? Sure. So in uh, our company at Golden Spiral, we actually have a proprietary exercise we call the buyer matrix. And I'll show you kind of a simplified version if I can share my screen here. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, let me see if it'll let me. Share screen. I hope you will work. Um, open. Oh, now it's asking me to do open preferences. Like, Yes. And then it's going to say quit. No. Okay. I can't do it. So let me draw it out for you really quick. Like okay. everybody knows um, like this kind of uh, mind map, right? Um, and I'm just kind of and is this conjecturing. Something to, or is this something that you have a, you know, you have something you want to share with people? What so this is something that I actually have not built into something, but I could build something for you. Let's see where the focus is. I can do this manually. Let me do a manual focus here. All right. So you've seen a mind map type of thing. Okay. Yeah. So imagine this is this over here is their customer. So here's a CEO. And then here is a CRO. And then here is, you know, um, uh, SVP of marketing, or here is whatever. Like these are the different components. And maybe if I switch hands, this would be easier. So these are the different people. And then this right here then triggers them to a different need. So this is a pain, a challenge. Like these are the different things that they're facing. And you list out all of them. And, and right now I just have an example of three but it could be nine, it could be 12. Like they all have different pain points. And then you would do it another component off of this would now become here. Uh, my focus is like, and now you're gonna do another you know, layer here 
of what is your solution to solve that pain. Okay. If you can do that, you are suddenly articulating everything you would need for your copy for marketing and sales copy. You're doing your content calendar. You're doing all the components for how to communicate on a sales call. Like you're following and creating a new journey, a buyer's journey, all by putting in that work. And it looks, you know, this right here looks kind of simple, simplistic, if you will. But the time that's required to do this right can be a little bit more invested. So if you take a day, you take two days or three days, depending on how big your company is, how big the, the potential buyer market is, suddenly now you are articulating very specific and precise messaging. And those are the things that people can feel compelled. Like it's almost like inception, like, you know what I'm experiencing, you know what I'm thinking. And now the message now becomes this invitation for them to know, like, and trust. Cause you've actually taken the time to get into the world, to stand in their shoes and to feel what they're feeling, to think what they're thinking and to see from a viewpoint that they're seeing. Now you articulate your product and service in a way that they immediately feel attached to. It's the hook. It's the gravity. It's a connection. And it's like, you love me. You really, really love me. That's what they're feeling. And now the conversation has changed in dynamics considerably. Fantastic. So we're going to make sure we get all those points. Uh, we're going to put those into the blog post recap uh, that we'll be publishing this weekend. Uh, let me see if anybody has any questions or comments on anything. So, yeah, Mona seems to have a question. Yeah, I was trying to read so, that. I'm not wearing my grass glasses, so now it just looks like I'm angry because I'm squinting. So let, I'm going to put this up. Let's see how it, I've never put this much text on screen before. So let's see how it looks. Sorry, Angus, we cut part of your head off there. It's okay. Actually, you can do a really cool like. That's perfect. <laughs> okay. um, my avatar is Betty Boomer. Seasoned woman is. Uh, business that hates social media because it leaves her feeling frustrated, stupid, and overwhelmed, but she has to be there. And the problem is she's not on social media too much. Facebook seems to be the best platform for her age group, but I struggle finding groups, hashtags, et cetera, for them. Any suggestions? Um, so I, there's some assumptions I have to make here. Um, I don't know what your business is, your um, your service or your product. I'm assuming that you're a marketing uh, person, either you're a marketing agency or, you know, in some way you're a consultant. That's my assumption. Mm -hmm. So if I'm approaching it from that perspective, um, you're looking at Betty Boomer and the invitation is, do you struggle with Facebook? Do you struggle with your business being able to appeal to the right people at the right time? Do you struggle with not having enough time in your day to commit to social media in the ways that you know are important to your business? Do you need help with that? All of a sudden, now you're speaking to all those components you just shared with me. Those are very real needs and pain points. And so if you're that, it just says you're a one-on-one -on -one coach, right? So you're teaching them these first things. Um, this is exactly what I just shared with you. So one other aspect that you didn't mention here would be security. For boomers, a lot of them jump on Facebook and the last thing they want is for all their posts to be seen by all the world because they think it's going to say something about them and where they live and what their social security number is and what their credit card numbers are. And they're afraid of all these things that they've heard. Mm -hmm. So the number one thing you could you know, present to them is, do you want to have your Facebook be secure? suddenly you're, you're, you're messaging something that's meaningful to them. Um, if it's somewhere where this business could appeal to, I don't know, I, I want to take it from a personal person and say to, to appeal to their families or to the grandkids and be able to connect, but that's a whole different uh, element. But if that's part of your business that you're not actually appealing to businesses, but actually to individuals, well then take that approach. Do you want to be able to share life's experience with your grandkids? Do you want to be able to have conversation with them using messenger? Like speak to the things that are going to be appealing to them and the things that are going to be meaningful. My wife and I were invited. Um, we actually were doing a contract for um, a cruise line, a Regent cruise line, which is uh, the luxury version of uh, 
uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines. I highly recommend it. Um, <laughs> they invited us uh, to kind of explore with them how to reach their boomers. <clears throat> and how do they build growth in terms of people that would come and, you know, be patrons of their cruises. And so I came up with an idea that said, what if we taught social media classes on the ship? And Wi-Fi was now becoming more prevalent. And so my wife and I actually got to go on a cruise from Athens, Greece, to a number of different stops all the way to Venice, Italy. Again, highly recommend. And they're super pricey. And one of the things that I said is the people that are on these ships, the most viable <clears throat> potential clients you have are their friends and family because like attracts like. And so if they're already in a place of affluence or wealth or, you know, some kind of status, then it's very likely that their family and friends are also going to be such. What if we could get them to create content through their social channels that would create some FOMO amongst their peers? And so we actually taught a class for them. And the first thing we taught was security, how to lock things down and have it only appropriate to the things you want. Second of all, we showed them how to take pictures, how to post those, those pictures, how to post their videos, and how to do slight tweaks to maybe add a filter to make it pop. And we then we did a little um, onshore excursion and we took some photos and we actually walked through them. So we did a series of classes through the cruise line. We did, I think, seven or eight classes, taught them how to do that, and then created a Facebook group that they could all share their experiences. And now that Facebook group is now the Facebook group for all their boomers that are going on uh, their cruises. And they're creating this massive amount of user generated content. So now it's even a adding even more value to the cruise line because they're actually getting access and insight into what these people are finding valuable, the things they're taking interest in and the content they're posting, asking them for permission. So now they can use their photos, use their videos in some of their promotional content. Awesome. Meet the need. So I think that's a great, uh, great, um, just like, Great example, I guess, going through that, you know, and helping, um, helping Mona with that, you know, so, uh, thank you so much, by the way, for sharing all that advice as well. With, yeah. Sorry. Uh, that was a lot, but, um, it was awesome. That was awesome. Hopefully that helps. That's, that's why Christian wouldn't come back on camera. He was like, oh. <laughs> I was over there processing it all actually. So <laughs> what we're going to do. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have Angus, if you can, by the way, I'm going to have you give us a couple of bullets, mm -hmm. um, after the show, we'll drop those in the blog post recap. Uh, for viewers, you know, so if they didn't get a chance to uh, watch and they want to actually read through some of this, we'll put that in the blog post recap. And I can send you that graphic, the one that I just, this rudimentary one, I actually have a slide. I can just kind of share that with you. As a Perfect. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure we get that included. So now what we're going to do real quick is we're going to move into tool time. And this is where we have uh, two tools. This could be hardware, software, whatnot that we've identified that can help you as a business, help you get more out of your business. So for example, you know, Angus talked about being on a cruise ship, cruise ships, you know, right now they might have, well, not right now, but cruise ships might have, you know, spotty Wi-Fi. You might need, you know, certain gadgets and whatnot, maybe to help you um, while you're on that cruise ship, for example. So we try to highlight something that might be useful for you. Um, but um, what I want to do today is I want to talk about two tools. Uh, Jim, where do you want to start, by the way, with the tools? Because I know, you know, I've talked about them. Yeah, let's let's start with Capwing because I, I I find that very fascinating um, and uh, definitely something I'm going to check out. So I've got Capwing pulled up here. Uh, do you want to tell viewers about Capwing? Yeah, so Capwing has both a free plan and a paid plan, <clears throat> and so with the free plan, you can upload a video up to ten minutes. Mm -hmm. And that what's nice is they don't actually put the watermark on here. I mean, a lot of these companies with a free version make you have a watermark. And it'll let you caption your video. Um, you can do a bunch of other stuff. There's there's memes. There's everything else. Um, yeah, the only limitations is the file size, and they'll store it for seven days. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's may be something that you want to make sure you download it. Which a lot of times I'm like, well, why wouldn't you download your own videos? Why keep it somewhere else? Right. And then the paid version will let you do videos up to forty minutes. That's twenty dollars a month. Um, and they say they have premium features. We really couldn't tell what that was, but, yeah. uh, it, this will let you create, you know, however you say memes, memes, gifs, jiffies, I don't know. And, and, uh, but it definitely looks, uh, very interesting. I think, uh, it's, it's another, you know, and that's, I, I Angus, I always joke that, uh, Christian creates all these issues for me cause he, he's always giving me all these tools and I, I get in the tool, you know, 
the the FOMO of tools, right? I don't want to miss out because I didn't try the tool out. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is this though looks really uh, really interesting, you know. And I think the biggest thing it's the captioning, and they even talk about it in here. Eighty five percent of people watch, uh, and I'm still trying to figure this out. Eighty five percent of people watch a video on Facebook with the sound off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, you know how to turn it on maybe because you got that could be it. Um, so if you can caption the video, not not to mention the accessibility issue uh, for mm -hmm. people that do have these challenges, if you're able to caption that video, you're going to get get more people involved. And, and that's where YouTube has that automatic closed captioning capability that uh, some of these other platforms don't have yet, because I think they're all starting to see that it's definitely a need. But yeah, I, I think it's definitely uh, like the, like the uh, idea of this. I'd heard about this from someone a, a few weeks ago, and and now we've, we've brought it up here and so yeah, Capwing, it uh, uh, looks like good stuff. And it does, a lot, and, and I think the point that I want to highlight is that, you know, if you're someone who wants to make video content, yes, you can do all of this on your mobile phone, or sorry, you can do, you can do the video shooting and editing on your phone. If you've got like I, an iPhone, for example, or an iPad, they have iMovie. If you just need basic editing, you can open a video that you record and you can actually do trimming really quickly just with your fingers. But where Capwing actually really shines, I think, is it gives you, A, the studio aspect. So you can go and you can build a video from start to finish. And, you know, chances are there's a bunch of templates in there as well that you can work from. But where it also is very useful is instead of having to go to another tool, it, it has a meme generator. It has the ability to take your uh, videos that you create and subtitle them so you can tap into that mm -hmm. audience as well. This, is, this means you don't have to learn an NLE editors such as Final Cut Pro or uh, or Adobe Premiere, for example, um, you can also add, for example, if you maybe make a video and you want to add some sound effects, you want to make something a little unique about it. It's got that functionality. It's got video, video resizing so you can make your content fit the platform it is going on to. You know, there, there's a whole host of features. I mean, these are all features that it gives you, um, which are pretty fantastic. The fact that you can watermark your videos and whatnot. Um, what do you think, by the way, Angus, about Capwing? Have you had a chance to use this one or do you use something else? Um, I haven't used this. Um, I actually use some other tools like you were just saying about um, your phone. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, here's one of the things that I run into is yeah. I can do different things with different tools. And oftentimes I have to like combine things. Like I'll create it in one thing and edit it. And then I'll have to export it to another thing to add music. And then I'll have to export it to another thing to add captions or something like that. Right. So like my fantasy is that somebody will finally figure this thing out that it should a, I could just shoot, you know, a video B it could automatically, you know, jump, jump, cut it, which there's an app for that already. Right. <clears throat> and then an extract parts and pieces of it into multiplied content yeah. and it would have images with some of the quotes that it had already pulled out from automatically putting in the captions. Like Definitely. to me, that is a miracle drug right there. Mm -hmm. Nobody's done that yet. Damn it. No. But <laughs> like, that's what I'm running into. So I look at a tool like this and I can say, you know what, if they can already, do you have to import the subtitles or does it do it for you? It uh, looks so like there's a subtitler in there. It does look like there's a subtitle, actually. And if you get the paid version of it, the paid version does give you the SRT file. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go over here to the pricing page. Um, definitely some, you know, here's the thing. I think it's worth checking out. I mean, it's 20 bucks a yeah. month if you want yeah. the pro plan. You know, you try it out, use the free yeah. version of it, you know, see yeah. how the features work and then go from there. Um, if you do want subtitling, I mean, I use a tool that's called Aegis Sub. And that basically is a way for you to get your SRT files really easily. Mm -hmm. But like you said, you also then have to import them back into the video metadata. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been that, using um, Headliner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. yeah there's there's yeah, so, so many program. tools now. Have you noticed like it's now we're on Onslaught. Before it was like one tool would come up, shiny object, and you're like, yes. And now there's like. Boom, 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 yeah. Boom, boom, boom. yeah, like a lot of people like quick and and quick is a nice tool, but you know, then you you get into, you know, do you want to get charged by the minute if you're doing a ton of video? Like that's what keeps me away from it. It's like, yeah, I'm not gonna, I don't like the the per minute type products, and uh, you know, but then it's kind of like, well, how much do I want to have to fix it because the the ones that sometimes aren't by the minute 
don't quite do the same transcription level mm -hmm. that others do, but yeah, it's right. They keep, By the way, they keep total, coming total, out. total side note. This is related, unrelated. Yeah. Um, if you use Zoom for meetings, there's mm -hmm. now a new feature that's starting to pop up where it's doing auto transcription. Mm -hmm. If you have their paid version, yeah. which yeah. I think is magical, especially if you use Zoom for podcasts or something like that. It's just a matter of time. I mean, you, we've, we're streaming on YouTube. YouTube is basically extracting everything and turning it into to searchable, you know, words and keywords. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, darn it! Just throw it in there. I didn't have to think about it. It's the 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 AI should be able to do it for me. You, you're thinking. You call yourself AI. You're artificial intelligence. Like I don't have to think about that. You should know what I want already. <laughs> so that's the first tool by the way it's cap wing and uh if anybody's if cap wing is listening by the way uh Jen, uh angus has some uh recommendations on how we can build the best <laughs> product so make sure you check out that so far it. fascinating i definitely want to dive in deeper yes so so uh the other tool we have is called pod corn and this is geared towards people who are podcasters but they want to monetize their podcast yeah. you know and uh, it basically helps you get connected with basically advertisers so mm -hmm. you know you're looking for a unique you know you have a, a unique piece of content you want to get out in front of people and so you want to get connected with the right brands whereas the brand might say hey you know what we have certain things that we want to get in front of uh, our listener our listeners and we want to work with podcasters so you know it's a, a basically a meeting space i guess in a way if you look at it from mm -hmm. that perspective um, yeah. What do you guys think about this one? And I think it's I think it's great. I think that this is the the struggle that a lot of people have, whether they're you know podcasters with this one specifically, but even mm -hmm. live streamers that start to build an audience is how do they monetize their efforts? I mean, a lot of times monetization is it's kind of like a book writer. Mm -hmm. The purpose behind this is not that you necessarily looking for listeners or readers is that you want them to do something else with you they you want them to hire you as a coach or that you want them to take your course and so i think um if you just think like oh i'm going to create content i'm gonna, and i'm going to get paid for producing my content it's not quite as easy as it sounds so i think it's great that there's a platform now that can maybe help those those two parties come together because there are some brands that maybe think like hey if i could get my you know my widget talked about on this person's show i mm -hmm. might get more more sales so i i think it's great um i just wonder if this will ever be something that opens up to to live streamers what, what do you what do you think christian um i think at some point i mean it it needs to it should i would hope um just because people are going to want to you know they want to monetize their show and the thing is if i go to somebody right now and i'm like well hey i want to you, you know i want to monetize my show um they're going to ask me, okay, well, they're going to say, what kind of viewers do you get? You know, and then if it's a software company, they might say, well, hey, like, why should I pay you when I can actually give you the software for free, for example, mm -hmm. um, versus actually giving you, you know, maybe the software and the money. So, you know, it, it is a, honestly, it's a very uphill battle to monetize, you know, a podcast or a live video show. So having something like Podcorn, I think would be very useful. Having it for live video, even more useful because that's the direction I think things are trending. Uh, what do you think, uh, Angus? So, so much of this is um, based off of, of per mil, right? Which is for every thousand viewers or thousand downloads, you know, in our live stream, we would say viewers, but in, in the podcast world, it's it's all based on listeners. That's how typically brands will price, you know, their um, per diem, per show or whatever. So it might be $25 per mil is what they call it. <clears throat> so you may not know this. So I, I'm a co-founder of the Nashville podcast meetup here in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh -huh. uh, we used to have monthly meetings up until COVID bless uh, that little virus's heart. Um, and so we have over 1100 uh, people in our Facebook group and every month we get between 15, and 80 people in attendance. So I know a little bit about podcasting in yeah. this context and so many of the podcasters are looking to make money for what they're doing and so the first thing they think of is advertising so in one respect i think this is super curious super interesting to know what the model is i'd have to dive in deeper to see if they're doing a per mil model or if they're doing a per episode model um to because sometimes if you can find niche you don't need a big audience 
And so the dynamics change if someone is speaking to a specific niche that's right in the core of your product line. Um, and that's what we emphasize in our uh, meetup is that you are better off to find a brand that's going to sponsor your show, not based on the typical per mill, but rather based on the audience and message or story you're telling. Mm -hmm. And you can make more money by saying, Hey, I'm in this perfect niche. You guys would be a perfect fit. We have ideal clients. I can put you in on a pre-roll, post, post-roll or mid-roll, and it's going to charge X amount of dollars. And that price you can give them is a flat fee. It's not based on how many listeners you just say, you know, $150 per show. You can say, you know, $75 per show or whatever you decide that that's going to be for that particular part of the role. And then if you can get two or three customers in there or, you know, advertising that your ideal, you're ideally set up, you know, for success to actually monetize your podcast. Um, and the last thing I'll say to this, because I'm passionate about podcasting, which doesn't have a whole lot to do about podcorn, but mm -hmm. I'd say if you have a product of your own, that's your best advertisement mm, definitely. is that your show is already catered to an audience. And if you have a product that's going to serve them or a service, you want to pitch that you'll be far more ahead of the game to profit a lot faster with something that you have massive control over. Definitely Great point. hundred percent agree with that. So, uh, so anything else you want to add about these tools at all? Um, mm -hmm. any other ones you want to recommend maybe? Yeah. Well, I mean, just in, in light of this, if you're just starting and you just want to go and explore, like I go check out Podcorn. Like I, I have no problem with checking it out. I think it's, like I said, I'm really curious. I might jump in myself. Um, and then for the video one, like I think some of these, these apps are getting closer and closer to being really um, amazing and video is the future. So mm -hmm. something like Capwing, um, not really a big fan of the name. If I'm going to be, um, yeah. I, I come from a branding agency, that name's kind of weird. Um, it doesn't say what you do. Um, yeah. but you know, aside from that, it looks like what they're offering is super valuable. And it's, it's the more that small and medium businesses can be able to get out in front of their audiences with things that are going to be appealing to the eye. Aesthetics are important and the sophistication of your product or service being matched by the sophistication of your messaging creates congruency that people can trust. If you are putting out stuff that's kind of junky or crappy, mm -hmm. then they have the potential of also assimilating your product or service to be the same. Aesthetics are super important. 100% agree with that. So, um, I want to thank everybody, by the way, for uh, tuning in this week. Uh, Jim, thanks for, again, co-hosting with me. Angus, absolute pleasure having you on the show. Um, I do have a question for you for viewers. If they want to get in touch with you, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Angus at AngusNelson.com. Shoot me an email, questions, comments, or concerns. Happy to help you. Fantastic. So uh, just a quick heads up, we're going to be publishing the blog post recap. And that's going to be uh, going out this weekend. So again, Angus, that was what? Angus at AngusNelson.com? AngusNelson.com. Yeah. Perfect. So make sure you connect with Angus. We're going to make sure we put um, his information as well. That he shared you know, about finding your uh, buyer persona, finding your target or your ideal customer. Make sure we put that in the blog post recap. And then we're also going to be going live again next Thursday. Jim, I, I know you're going to be excited about this one. Uh, we're going to have... Next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, Stephanie Liu is yeah. going to be joining us. Nice. And that's going to be, uh, yeah, I know, like, this is like the run up to like the eCam virtual summit. I know because we're all presenting on that one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Stephanie Liu. Uh, she goes by Hey Stephanie, and that's on facebook.com slash social chefs or youtube.com forward slash uh, social chefs. Uh, with that, I'm going to take us out, but it's been a pleasure having you both on. Thanks hey, thanks so much. I just put a link Thank in there um, in the private chat um, sure. to a mindset training accelerator that I created that I it's a freebie. Like if you're listening and you're going through stuff and you need to reset your brain, uh, reset your focus and get yourself accelerated into the future of opportunity, um, then this is uh, it's about an hour long video that is going to take you through my process. Well, we'll make it's sure it's a great video. Recap. So thank you so much for sharing that with yeah, me. My pleasure. So we will see you all next week.
Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for having me, guys.